Hi, my name is Joe Axel. I work for the Northwestern Indiana Regional Plan Commission as a water resource planner. Sorry we couldn't be together in person today for the science symposium, so we're going to go ahead and try this virtually. What we're going to be doing today is we're going to be heading down to uh, one of my local streams by my house. I just finished loading up my Jeep with some sampling equipment, and we're going to talk a little bit about how do we monitor a stream's health. So this morning, we're going to head over to a uh, Lake County Park site, uh, uh, Deep River Park, not the water park site. Uh, this is the uh, location where the old mill is at. It's a, a beautiful wooded uh, property uh, uh, that goes along the river. Uh, but what's really in kind of interesting about this uh, location is it is has some of the highest quality uh, uh, habitat and water quality within the uh, Deep River watershed. Now watershed is simply just the area of land that drains to a particular point on a water body. Um, watersheds come in all different shapes and sizes. Uh, uh, we all live in a watershed and why understanding what a watershed is uh, and why it is important as far as stream health is because whenever it rains or it snows and that snow melts and uh, runs off uh, uh, across the landscape, it's got the potential of picking up uh, uh, harmful pollutants and delivering them to our receiving water bodies uh, such as Deep River. Not all of Deep River is in kind of a, a, a natural uh, conditions. Uh, as I mentioned, the park that we're going to is largely uh, wooded. Uh, there are large portions of the Deep River watershed that, uh, you know, uh, have been developed for us where our houses are, where we go shopping. Uh, to even some of the uh, uh, farm fields. So all these potential uh, areas may or might, might not uh, uh, affect water quality. It just depends on uh, what we're doing on the landscape and uh, uh, trying to protect uh, streams and rivers. There are three different ways that we can monitor how healthy or unhealthy a stream is. Uh, the first way that the, in the uh, topical area most people are probably most familiar with would be uh, water chemistry. Now water chemistry can evaluate uh, a number of environmental and uh, factors that are important uh, 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 for protecting aquatic life and uh, uh, even recreational use of our, our water bodies uh, such as a stream. Um, some of those factors include the amount of oxygen that is available in the water. Uh, we call that dissolved oxygen. Dissolved oxygen is really important for supporting diverse and healthy uh, uh, fish communities and other forms of aquatic life. Uh, then there are other factors such as the amount of nutrients uh, that might be available or being carried uh, within the water. Uh, the most uh, important uh, nutrients that we typically would be looking at would include things like uh, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, both of which are naturally occurring in the environment. But uh, whenever you get human land uses involved within a watershed, you have a potential of having too much nutrients delivered to a water body. Uh, in a worst case scenario, and something maybe you've all seen before, especially like during a hot summer day, is let's say you're driving down the road and you see a lake or a pond that is just pea green in color. That's because there's too much nutrients in the water. Uh, that is algae. Uh, it's an algae bloom. Uh, responding to uh, most likely uh, excess uh, phosphorus in the water, and in some cases uh, nitrogen as well. A little bit of nutrients is okay, having too much is bad for the environment and can be very bad for uh, public health too. Another factor we can look at uh, as far as uh, uh, water chemistry uh, is looking at the amount of uh, uh, sediment that is being carried uh, within the water column. Um, just kind of like uh, with uh, looking at nutrients where excess, you can kind of get that pea green color. Uh, uh, with sediment, uh, what you wind up seeing is a, a river that looks uh, muddy. So uh, those are three of the major water chemistry factors that we can evaluate, whether it is a uh, professional scientist, say somebody from the Department of Natural Resources of, or Department of Environmental Management out uh, assessing uh, uh, streams.
or I mean, even volunteers uh, uh, that might be participating in a program like uh, Hoosier River Watch, which is a, a statewide volunteer stream monitoring uh, network. The other way that we can evaluate how healthy or unhealthy a stream is, is to look at uh, uh, the habitat that is uh, available within the stream and the habitats existing uh, next to the stream. Uh, it, it's a factor that is often overlooked uh, in regards to uh, stream health. Uh, just because you have good water quality, uh, you know, like let's say you have really good dissolved oxygen levels and nutrients aren't too high, that doesn't mean that there might, there might not be a problem with uh, uh, habitat quality. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, a natural stream channel uh, within our landscape here in northwest Indiana is typically going to meander as it flows uh, across the land. And a meander just means that there are bends that occur in the river. Uh, that, that would be what we would uh, normally see uh, in uh, 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 natural conditions in a landscape li uh, like ours as opposed to like a, uh, a ditch, something that was just excavated for the sole purpose of uh, uh, moving water uh, off the landscape as quickly as possible and efficiently as possible. So with like a ditch, you know, that is uh, meant to kind of drain the landscape. It doesn't matter if it was for agricultural fields or even for uh, uh, drainage for uh, housing development. Uh, most aquatic life is not gonna like to live in uh, stream conditions uh, uh, like that. There is very little uh, habitat variability in a channelized or a ditch uh, compared to a natural stream conditions. So uh, we typically expect to see very tolerant to organisms growing in there. Uh, things like uh, 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 carp uh, might be an example that most people would be uh, familiar with. Uh, things that have evolved over time to handle really kind of rough conditions as opposed to like a meandering stream uh, uh, that is nice and shaded where we might expect uh, to see, like for instance here uh, along the southern tip of Lake Michigan, uh, uh, trout and salmon. So habitat is very, very important. Uh, habitat quality, I should say, is very important to uh, help assess how healthy or unhealthy a stream is. The final uh, way we can assess the health of a stream, and one of my favorites, is actually look at the aquatic life itself. While water chemistry provides us kind of a snapshot, uh, uh, just a moment of time, uh, uh, how healthy the, the stream might be uh, when we grab that water quality sample, when we go out and we monitor aquatic life, uh, what that is providing us is more kind of a, uh, a long-term uh, 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 impacts that have happened to that river. It, it's a larger, it provides a larger window uh, uh, on what those organisms might have been uh, exposed to, uh, whether it's water chemistry changes or even changes to habitat. Uh, so today, uh, what I'm gonna go ahead and show you all uh, how to do is how we can use aquatic macroinvertebrates to assess stream health. Now aquatic macroinvertebrates, if we just break that down aquatic, meaning they live in water, uh, uh, benthic, meaning uh, they live on the bottom, macro, meaning we can see them with the naked eye, and vertebrate, meaning they don't have a backbone. So these are going to include things like uh, uh, snails, insects, uh, uh, clams, uh, uh, mussels, uh, uh, things like that. Um, all those things uh, are potential indicators of water quality and habitat. Uh, next, I'm going to show you the equipment that uh, anybody uh, 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 can use to go ahead and assess stream health. Collecting macroinvertebrates uh, is relatively simple uh, uh, from a river. You don't really need uh, heavily specialized equipment uh, uh, to do so. Uh, so for instance here, uh, I've got a uh, very simple uh, uh, sweep net. Uh, you can use something like a butterfly net or if you've gone through the Hoosier River Watch program and had the training, uh, you can check out uh, some of their monitoring equipment, which includes a net just like this. Uh, I also have a little uh, wash tub, uh, preferably something with a uh, uh, kind of like a white bottom or walls uh, would be would be great to have. Uh, it makes seeing the macroinvertebrates uh, a lot more easy. 
Uh, also, uh, I had access to some spoons at home and uh, uh, some plastic cups. So that's actually what you need there for the collection. Uh, I also happen to have a pair of waders. The water is still a little bit cool. And since I do uh, some stream fishing, uh, I've got my own pair of waders. So you can see the boots and the waders themselves. Uh, uh, then a notebook. Uh, it's one of the beauties of uh, uh, monitoring for macroinvertebrates uh, uh, equipment wise is there's really no special need uh, and uh, uh, you don't need permits uh, uh, to go ahead and collect and monitor like if you were to do a uh, fishery survey so uh, relatively simple setup here uh, here's a section of river that we're going to be uh, monitoring uh, on deep river um, go ahead and looking downstream right now you can see this little sandbar in the middle of the stream channel on the opposite bank uh, you can see a little bit of rocks uh, uh, along the toe of the slope and you can see some tree roots that are currently above the water uh, water is moving a little bit more quickly on that outside bend, uh, which one would expect and a little bit slower on the inside uh, uh, of the bend here and moving downstream. Uh, you can see this is a nice wooded corridor and you can start to see kind of the, the little glimmering uh, and uh, ripples on the water. That's what's known as uh, riffle habitat. This is one of the uh, few locations here in Northwest Indiana where you have uh, uh, conditions that are favorable to uh, providing this type of habitat. Uh, uh, for aquatic life, uh, that being the riffle habitat. And the inside of this point, you can see this big old pile of sand. Uh, Deep River is very dynamic in this stretch. Uh, all the sand was not here uh, uh, last year, so that means that this all accumulated uh, uh, over the winter and this early part of the spring after uh, flood flows carried sediment down, sand in this case, uh, from upstream sources. So. Uh, this is the area that we're going to go ahead and be sampling in. I'm all wadered up now, uh, so what we're going to go ahead and do is uh, uh, fill up uh, a tub of water. Um, that's where we're going to go ahead and put the macroinvertebrates that we collect with our sweep net. And we're going to sample about uh, 200 foot uh, reach of stream here. That would be the methodology that we would use in Hoosier River Watch. And when we're done with that stretch, uh, we'll take a look at the different types of macroinvertebrates we found. Uh, one thing I forgot to kind of mention earlier, while I have access to waders, that does not mean that you have to have waders to do uh, macroinvertebrate sampling. Uh, closed toe shoes would work as long as the uh, water temperatures are fine, uh, but you definitely Definitely uh, need something that it has uh, uh, closed toes on there uh, for safety reasons, especially if the water is murky and you cannot see. Uh, alternatively, you can go ahead and use like a little uh, uh, welly boots or hip boots if you have those. And the macroinvertebrates, they're not going to be found uh, uh, every square inch of the, the bottom of the river here. Uh, they are actually going to be kind of uh, distributed uh, throughout this stretch on different uh, in different habitat types and uh, different flows. Macroinvertebrates uh, uh, are basically they follow a uh, patchy distribution uh, 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 throughout the river, which is not uh, uncommon. Different types of have of uh, macroinvertebrates have different preferences for the types of uh, habitat. Uh, and flows that they like to live in. Uh, some of the key areas that we want to make sure that we sample with our sweet nut uh, are going to be sampling uh, piece, pieces of wood or woody debris uh, within the river. We want to make sure that we sample uh, uh, little rocky uh, shallow areas and the water's flowing across. These are typically going to be very uh, diverse uh, macroinvertebrate communities. Uh, in the, these habitats, these riffle habitats. Uh, but as I kind of mentioned earlier, not all of our streams here in Northwest Indiana uh, 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 have riffle habitats. So that's where woody debris becomes really important. Other factors that we want to consider uh, when sampling the stream is that we want to make sure that we uh, collect from different uh, flow types uh, within the river. 
we want to hit some of those really slow flowing areas, uh, maybe next to the stream bank and where it's shallow, to areas where the stream flows a little bit swifter, but still over uh, shallow areas. And then kind of moving out a little bit further where it's the water flow is still pretty, pretty good, but becomes a little bit deeper. And then we want to hit uh, uh, as safely as we possibly can uh, uh, some of the deeper areas where the water flows are slow. We want to do this uh, uh, within our entire 200 foot reach. Okay, this is kind of what our sweep net looks like uh, uh, once it's in the water. Uh, I've got the bottom of the net firmly pressed uh, uh, to the uh, substrate or the uh, bottom of the stream. And you can see that the flow of the water uh, is moving from the top of the stream to the bottom of the stream. And it is also opening up my uh, uh, sweep net. So what I can go ahead and do in an area like this where I've got uh, shallow faster moving water is I can use my feet. I don't know how well I'm going to be able to do this and kick the area in front of the net with my foot and what it's going to do is it's going to displace sediment and rocks and hopefully some macro and vertebrates uh, that were sitting on the bottom and those are going to be carried and trapped inside the net and I can lift that up and then I can sort through that sample to see what I find in there. Just kind of one thing to kind of note for today, it is still very much so uh, early in the season. Uh, I'm not expecting to see a whole lot because the water is still uh, very cold. Uh, the later we get into spring here, as the water warms up, uh, we'll start to see more macroinvertebrates. Uh, what winds up happening during the winter time, macroinvertebrates have two options. They can either kind of uh, get through the season as eggs uh, and hatch a little bit later on as uh, water conditions warm up, or they can kind of hunker in place as adults in low flow areas. But right now, uh, most individuals that we're going to see are probably going to be really tiny, but we're going to try our best today. So what I want to do now is go ahead and pick through the net, uh, go through the different uh, uh, material here, like the rocks and the plants and algae growing, growing on the bottom of the stream. I want to sort through this net and try to pick out anything I see uh, moving uh, on here and go ahead and place it in our tub. Okay, so kind of like I thought, I uh, didn't collect a whole bunch of uh, uh, different macroinvertebrates today. The, like I said, the water is still relatively uh, cold, uh, but uh, we did pick up a few things. Uh, I think most everybody knows what this guy is right over here in the uh, uh, lower right hand corner of the uh, uh, frame. That is a crayfish who is now kind of on the move. Got a smaller one there and one that is just a little bit bigger. Uh, trailing right behind him, there is another uh, uh, caddisfly. It looks like he is attached uh, to the crayfish right now with his little silk strand. Here's our caddisfly. Uh, Swimming around now. This is an interesting caddisfly. Uh, this one uh, is a, uh, a free-living caddisfly. Some caddisflies actually build little uh, cases or houses that they carry around uh, uh, on their uh, abdomens or backs that they kind of tuck into, like little tubes. Uh, it's like having a little uh, home that they carry with them, uh, where they can hide from predators. Uh, this one isn't alive, but. Uh, uh, this is a, uh, a clamshell. Uh, it happens to be actually a type of invasive, but they've been here for such a, a long time. They're nowhere near as prevalent as some of the ones in Lake Michigan. This is known as an Asian clam or corbicula. This little white, it's kind of interesting, these little white uh, 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 spheres or whatever. Those are eggs of some sort. You can kind of see the yolk in the center. I don't know if those are fish eggs or what. But uh, it is that time of year where uh, uh, a lot of things are going to be, uh, eggs are going to be being laid and newborn are going to start hatching. Uh, there's another caddisfly over in there. I found some uh, blackfly uh, larva. Uh, they kind of look like uh, the shape of a, a bowling pin. And they fasten themselves on the bottom of the stream. Uh, they would be what we would find in that shallower, swifter moving water. 
water, they have little fan-like mouth parts that they uh, uh, filter out their food uh, uh, from the water column that the stream carries to them. As a little safety cord, they also produce a little silk strand uh, that they attach themselves to the bottom of the stream. A caddis fly going on along for a ride <laughs> on top of the crayfish. Usually I have to worry about the crayfish eating the stuff that I pick up uh, uh, from the stream. There's our little uh, isopod, also known as a sow bug, moving along. And there is something I wanted to show you all. That guy that was kind of wiggling there in the lower left hand corner of the uh, frame, uh, that is actually a uh, midge larva. Uh, midges kind of almost look like, uh, as adults, they would look like a, uh, a mosquito, but uh, uh, they don't necessarily have that biting mouth part to uh, suck blood. One thing that's kind of interesting uh, about what we have in the sample here is that most of the uh, macroinvertebrates I have in the tub, with the exception of the clamshell and the uh, crayfish, uh, these are all the juveniles or young ones. As adults, a lot of macroinvertebrates, uh, they're terrestrial, uh, meaning they live out in open air uh, 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 like we do. So they're only spending a portion of their life uh, living within the stream or the water itself. The reason that we're able to use macroinvertebrates as indicators of stream health is because different types of macroinvertebrates have different tolerance levels to pollution and uh, a habitat. So uh, in general, what we have in the tub here, uh, I would say overall, uh, this based on the few things that are in here, it, it, this is a moderately healthy stream. Uh, it, it, it's not too bad. I mean, caddis flies are considered for the most part uh, a pretty decent indicator of water quality. Uh, some of the other ones in here, uh, uh, like the black fly uh, uh, larvae and the crayfish are, uh, you know, a little bit lower down. Uh, not quite as good at indicators of water quality and habitat, but overall not too bad. But having sampled this site before, I know that we've collected some other uh, macroinvertebrates that are very good indicators of water quality. Uh, couple of those include something called a uh, mayfly, um, also live on the bottom. They require high amounts of oxygen dissolved in the water, uh, swift water flows uh, for many of them, and just really good habitat uh, as well. Uh, so we've seen those in the past here in the stream, and also stoneflies uh, needing similar conditions to those of the mayfly. Uh, actually, the uh, uh, Caddis flies, mayflies, and stoneflies are considered some of the best indicators of uh, water quality and habitat. So usually where you can find those, uh, uh, yeah, you know, you're pretty far down the path on uh, uh, having a, 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 a healthy stream. But uh, kind of all in all, uh, not too bad, but uh, kind of what I was expecting for this early in the season. Well, that's going to wrap it up uh, for the day. Uh, thank you for joining me for this virtual uh, uh, stream tour and uh, uh, assessment. Uh, hopefully you all got something uh, out of this. Uh, I know I sure have because I've never done uh, 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 kind of a video before, at least doing like a... a, a I guess this is my first vlog. Uh, I guess even uh, Attenborough had to start off somewhere uh, before he started doing a series like Planet Earth and the like. So uh, thanks again uh, for more information. Uh, if I piqued your interest at least uh, today, I would definitely encourage you all to check out uh, the Hoosier River Watch program. Uh, just use your internet search of choice. Uh, uh, type in Hoosier River Watch. Uh, should take you to uh, Department of Environmental Management management uh, uh, web page and from there you can find a, about a whole bunch of information uh, about the statewide program as a whole and take a little bit of a, a, a deeper dive so uh, thanks again uh, once again my name is Joe Exel with the Northwestern Indiana Regional Planning Commission hope to see you out in the water soon thanks bye